<laughs> wow, praise the Lord. We have an unbelievable amount of sunshine coming through that gives me kind of like a halo effect. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. Now I look like I got a halo, maybe. But the point is, the sun has risen with healing in his wings. That's one of the scriptures that comes from the Bible, that when God breathes life into it, it becomes for you the veritable word of God. We teach in Living in Eternity the principle of the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of God, taking something that's inanimate and making it animate. Now, you would use the word animation to put together the principle of what the Holy Spirit does with the Bible. You see, the Bible is just the word. It's a book of books. It is a written anthology of the history of the children of Israel, the history of the world, the fullness of Jesus himself, and the reality of God creating the universe. Now, as a book of books, it's powerful because of its poetic influence, of its intellectual stimulation, of its logic, of its precision, of its laws, of its ethos, of many things that are contained in the book. But the book is not the book of life. The book itself is simply a book that's printed on paper. In order for it to become the word of God, in order for it to become that with which we are told within its own pages, the word that proceeds from the mouth of God, that man would not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from God himself, that takes and requires, as the Bible itself says so, within the pages that you read it, the key to unlock its mystery, the reality of being able to be given the ability to understand it. You have to have something more than just eyes to read. You have to have eyes to see. You have to have ears to hear what it is the Spirit of God is telling you and applying to your life. For the Word of God to become alive and living in you, it has to come from the Bible as it is written and the Spirit of God by making you born again of that same spirit that overflowed from Jesus. Now that makes it an interesting concept because then suddenly this Bible we have, this book of books, this word that is transcribed or written into what we have in English and wide variety of different variations and denominations and translations and genuflections and reflections are all valid in some way. Because you see, if the Spirit of God is the one who gives us eyes to see what he would have us to, then when we're reading it, some portion of it will stand out. Some part of it will suddenly become, whoa, magnified. And the way that he does that <clears throat> is by, as we said, taking the inanimate and making it animate. <clears throat> that is also the process of animation. Now, I don't know if you know this, but animation really is what are called still put together one after the other with just a slight variation in each one so that as you take one still and as you go to the next still, and if you do it in succession, it looks like the still picture is moving. That's what the Bible is. By itself, sitting still, it does nothing. I mean, it's just a book. You can throw it out the window and it'll crash and burn or hit the ground or, you know, kill somebody if you're high enough up. There you go. <laughs> but really, it's still just a book. But when it becomes animate, when God breathes life into the written word, it becomes the living word. In other words, it is that taking of one portion or part and making it, as it were, move for you. And the way that happens is by you reading it and living it. You see, living it means that you're going from 
moment by moment, or as the song says, breath by breath, you know, every breath I take, every move I make, is an old Jesus freak song. And really, when you do realize that, it, that's how the Bible becomes alive. You become the living word of God. You become the testimony of God. You become the workmanship of Jesus. As you move and have your being, in him we live and move and have our being. So as we are born of that spirit, then, okay, hey, read your Bible. Then your Bible, as you are led by the spirit of God, given ears to hear what it is the spirit of God is saying, given eyes to see what the spirit would reveal to you, then he whom God has sent to us to be our comforter will guide and abide in us to provide for us a revelation of Jesus. Now, without that, you know, I mean, systematic theology is nice, but it's only a system of examining the externality or the external things of God, which means on the outside looking in. And that's nice for systematic theology. I teach integral specificity. What is, is, and it is as it is the way it is. In other words, there's a specificity, there's a design, there's a purpose for every dot and tittle in the Word of God. There's a reality of how God makes the Word of God come alive. And the basic premise of everything in integral specificity is that the specifics of the integral design relate to the encompassing, the encompassing of the entire whole. And in integral specificity, when you look at the DNA structure of what integral specificity is, that you look it up on Google, of course, because you don't know what integral specificity is, then you realize that it does have a purpose. It does have a design, but you have to get that from the outside going to the inside and then looking from the inside to the outside. That is really kind of like the DNA of the Bible. It is integrally specific. And it is relatable to that by nature of its own being that is the spirit of god that's why when you hear people talk about so many denominations or so many specifications of how they want to live their life that's what denominations are it's just simply people getting around and talking around and talking about the bible on the outside to try to apply things to go on the inside in a certain way and manner and specific design that they want to follow. So a Catholic will follow the Catholic way of life. The Protestant will follow the Protestant or Protestant way of life. The Lutheran, the Luther's way of life. The Methodist, the methodology, methodology, methodological, methodological, the method way of life. When Jesus was talking to his disciples, he said, whoa, be careful. Don't follow the way of the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the scribes or the Sabaeans or, you know, I mean, the Sabaeans weren't around, but, the, you know, the, the Essenes or the other 30 or so odd religious leaders of his day. He said, listen to what they say, but watch what they do, because you got to be careful. What they say may be different than what they do. They may not walk the talk. So Jesus warned about following him as opposed to following men. When we follow Jesus, he allows us to follow men. He allows us to go different ways and perspectives as long as we choose to follow him in our day. And the only way that we can follow Jesus today without following what men have to say about him as opposed to Jesus describing himself and revealing himself to you is the Spirit of God. On New Year's, we have an option to back, to look forward, to look ahead, and maybe just to stop dead in our tracks and to look up. I personally like the idea of ignoring New Year's Day, simply because every day is a day unto the Lord. So we should live each day as unto the Lord in a manner that's pleasing in His sight. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation. Today is the day the Lord has made. Today is often what we call the eternal now. This is how God reveals himself to us today. He doesn't reveal us to him. He doesn't reveal himself to us tomorrow, 
for no man is promised tomorrow. We don't know whether we'll die or not tomorrow. Now, death is one way of revelation of God because suddenly you realize there is a God. Whether you doubted him or not, every atheist will know there is a God because they will stand before him. Now, when we stand before him, we give an accounting for our life. And I would choose to this day as every day, but this day, especially on New Year's Day, to choose whom I will serve. For others may serve the gods of men. Some may serve their job. Some may serve their wife. Some may serve their family traditions. Some may serve their mother, their father. Some may serve in jobs that are specific to following a humanistic mentality like, oh, be good, do good, and act good. Well, sounds good, but Jesus said there was none good except his Father in heaven. So I guess if you're going to follow goodness, you would have to follow God and do what he says. But that's not what humanism is. The coexist movement, the uh, evangelical American Christianity, all of these want to somehow make you do, by your own effort, better than what you did before. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of a screw-up. <laughs> I'm kind of messed up most of the time. <laughs> well, you know, I sometimes have to clean up my act and get dressed up. And when I do, I clean up pretty good. At least that's what God says. Now, because God does the cleaning up, I get to get dressed up and then walk in his righteousness. I get to put on his perfection. I get to adorn myself with his works, not my own. So I find myself really in my day-to-day -day existence not so interested in what was or what will be, but what is. And that's why integral specificity, its definition by way of its own specificity, is what it is. It is what it is, where it is, the way it is. And that's what I am. I am what I am, that I am, that I am. And that's what God said really to Moses. He said, look, I don't have a name. I am that I am. I mean, this, what I am is what I am. What do, what do I do? Call myself something I'm not? And that's why God didn't give him a name. Calling him I am is not really his name. You know? It's not Yahweh and it's not Jehovah. I mean, or even Jehovah, but the Yahshua's want to call it Yayas, you know, and they want to play yo-yos with the words. So, you know, let them play yo-yos with Yaya and go, no, no, <laughs> no, no, no. But seriously, 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 when it comes to living with God in eternity, you should be living each day as unto the Lord. You should be living each day as with the Lord. You should be an example of God in us, God with us, God for us, God directing us. So if I could give you a word for the year, give you a word for the day, I would say, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether it seems better for you to turn to, you know, employment, coaches, religion, churches, God, whatever it may be, fine, go do that. Maybe I can give you a word that will help you out with that. Spend eight hours a day doing that, or ten or twelve, whatever you do. But in your heart of hearts, when you're alone, and that might, for some of you, might only be in the bathroom, you know, when you're doing your duty to John, you know, or serving your, your daily experience, you know, with the reality of who you really are. What you did with what you've done and what you do is doo-doo. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Then choose you at that moment even, but choose you this day whom you'll serve. For as for me, 2016, here we are. Whoa. So? <laughs> it's almost like 5779, I think, or 5778. I'm not sure which in the Jewish calendar right now. But choose you specifically for yourself whom you will serve. As for me and my house, and I make sure everyone in my house, ask my wife, does this. Nobody comes to my house really to stay very long unless they choose to follow Jesus. Oh, I may allow you some hostage.
totality. But that doesn't mean that I won't share with you the reality of Jesus. You see, the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, to the people of God, of the Son of God, Jesus, is what we are all about. As far as hearing his voice, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and they will not follow the voice of another. And I've heard it said that there's even a good friend of mine, a woman pastor. Yes, she's a woman, and yes, she's a pastor. She's heard God speak, and yet people of her relationships in the world deny her the freedom to be able to say, Hey, I've heard God speak audibly. I got news for you. Every Jew better be saying, yeah, me too, because most of them aren't now. And that's why God has caused the partial blindness and a lot of deafness to come upon the children of Israel. But that doesn't mean he leaves it that way. If you watch Fiddler on the Roof, that's how God speaks. When Fiddler's going, hey, God, such a deal. Hey, are you listening? Good. Then I'm going to be talking. And if you're talking, take notes. Or if I'm talking, take notes, and if you're talking, I'll listen, maybe. But the point is, I don't know how people can say God doesn't speak, because God is speaking every day. We would not exist if God was not, in reality, speaking. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that God speaks. If you've settled for less than hearing God's voice, that's your fault, not God's. You just haven't bothered to listen or even stayed and sat long enough to. I know most of you really in rebellious ways think that you don't want to hear God speak because you want to go do your thing anyways. You know, well, I got my Bible, so I'm going to go do what I want to do according to what I expositionally draw from it and then teach propositionally to preaching to those who I have to give an account of. Well, good luck with that. Man, I mean, I'm not responsible literally, for all the lives in the universe. God is. I am willing to preach and teach so that my hands are free from the blood of every man. I'm willing to allow for the Spirit of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God to reach out through me to others. But I'm sure not going to take the stupidity of thinking that I am responsible for every other man. No. I'm going to New Year's Day 2016 tell you simply in a simple way. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the Lord isn't some Lord that's, you know, some mystical, magical, made-up thing. No, we're talking about the Lord Jesus. We're talking about, for those who are messianic, because after all, you know, there's a lot of more Jews getting saved than you know. What do you think? What can you say? If Jews are getting saved? Hey, that means it's the end of the world for you Gentiles. <laughs> Oops. Ouch. Ooh. Whoa. More Jews saved? Well, we better quit saving them. But seriously, Yeshua Mashiach, or you know, if you prefer, Yehoshua, Aben Elohim, you know, Joshua, the Son of God, because he is God. Elohim, as God, is God, was God, never shall be God. So, frankly, it sounds harsh. It sounds serious. And we're told to be sober-minded in these latter days, and we are in the last days. We have maybe maybe a year, maybe for some of you not a year, but if you live that long, you have maybe a year, maybe two, if you're lucky, five, but I wouldn't count on five. So as you look forward to, you know, your 2016 timetable, and, you know, you project your plans, you know, you lay out your insurance, set out insurance, and, you know, all these other things that you feel like you need to do. Um, hey, get saved. If you don't, I don't give a damn. I mean, I may love you, but your choice is your choice. I can't stop you from being stupid. I can't stop you from making bad choices. I can advise you. I can warn you. And I can tell you something very interesting for your Bible study. If you're one of those that really likes to, you know, catch something Micah might have said and go running with it, you know, take it off on your own huge revelation of Jesus to you, because the Spirit of God will take you a long ways on this one. Look up the word if. I mean, I, I'm sorry I have to use the King James Bible, because you know I know, understand, and realize that King James Bible is now preferred less, and ESV is preferred more, but 
really, I, since I know it better, and I happen to know the words behind it, look up in the King James Bible, if. If a man will humble himself, if. Today, if you, today, if you hear his voice. There's a lot of ifs in the Bible. The if is the reality for you that when you see the word if, you better pay close attention to what God is saying because he's giving you a choice. Even as Joshua and Moses said, choose you this day who you will serve. You choose. Go ahead. Make your declarations. Most people will say, yes, sir. Some people will say, I pledge allegiance, and I'll go, not me, man. I'm not pledging allegiance to any flag. First of all, the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America was not a Christian thing to do. In fact, it was rejected by most people that were Christians in their day, but because of communism, ooh, we got to profess our faith in America. You could say that maybe the Pledge of Allegiance was about the time that the birth of the falling away of American Christians started. Because they started following America more than they started following God. So when people tell me that they want to put the Pledge of Allegiance in you know, the public schools, I say, now me, man, I ain't pledging no allegiance to the flag. I'm not going to pledge allegiance to the temple in Jerusalem. I'm not going to pledge allegiance to anybody. You know, Jesus warned us, don't pledge allegiance. Don't swear. Don't make oaths. Said, no, none at all. Uh-huh. Baby, you're in trouble. And yet, you know, you'll see the military stand up, you know, and they'll say, I, you know, swear to uphold the Constitution and all the other things that you can force swear yourself to do. And frankly, while you're in the military, dude, you're screwed. God holds you accountable. You made the oath. You live it. So go out and kill. You won't come back the same. You won't serve the same either. You'll have blood on your hands. Sorry. Back to nature. God said so. Thou shalt not kill, period. That's the way it works. You can't be a priest. You can be something else, but you're not going to be a priest. You got blood on your hands. Look at David. Well, so you're a man of war. When they beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. I realized and recognized pretty early on when I was forsworn to do stupid things that I had already got myself into, that God doesn't want me to learn war. He doesn't want me to learn how to kill. He doesn't want me to learn the ways of the gods of men, the ways of violence. He wants me to put it to an end and to live in eternity. So you can choose today to follow the way that you, maybe you got yourself in trouble to today, and you'll suffer the consequences. But in your heart, if you need to, in your heart, if you have to, in your heart, if you want to, choose today to repent, to turn around, to turn your heart over upside down and say, help me, Jesus. That's all. Help me, Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. No theology on this. No getting all carried away. But choosing this day. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You know, loving your neighbor, well, that comes along with the territory. But first start off with God and he'll work on you with the rest. Because, frankly, when, she, when Keith Green was talking about do your best and pray that it's blessed you, seek to, he was assuming you were seeking Jesus already with everything. A lot of people don't want to hear what Jesus has to say today. They want to do what they want to do when they want to do it, which is why we talked about the natural order of things. The natural order of your thing is to go do doo-doo every morning. I mean, literally, if you're healthy or if you're old. I mean, some of the old people get real thrilled about going doo-doo. Ooh, ooh, ooh. My wife goes, yay! You know, runs run around all day happy. Hmm, doesn't take much to make her happy. She married me. But the point, <laughs> really, there you go. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> but the point being, simply is that doing your own thing what you do do is what you do do and you make do do i mean you take in you eat you know you do all this stuff but you refuse i would prefer that you actually use 
what you might refuse, because God takes the things that are considered dishonorable and makes them honorable. God takes the things that are least and makes them most. God reverses the order of your thinking so that you no longer have the ability to take credit for anything, but that you give all glory and honor and praise to the one who created you, to the one who saved you, to the one who's leading you to the place of salvation. That is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when we choose this day in 2016 to go our way, living out each day as living in eternity, we expect God to speak. We expect God to direct. We expect God to live in us. We expect God to provide for us. We expect God as our protection. We expect God as our guide. We expect really to abide in him and he in us. We need to do no other thing but to trust in the Lord with all our heart. To lean not to our own understanding but in all our ways to acknowledge him and let him direct our path. And if we have any question about what in the world is going on, then we do choose to ask of God, who will pray it not, but give it to all men early. Because if any man lack wisdom, he can ask of God, who give it, who will pray it not, but give it to all men early. Meaning that he gives to every man an answer for the hope that lies within them, that is, from his own throne room of grace, Jesus talking to God face to face and sending answers to you by way of his spirit allowing you to know what is his will. That is really what James was talking about, James 1 5. And in Proverbs 3 5 and 6, trusting the Lord. So I don't know what you'll do. You know, I mean, God knows, you know, I pray you make it. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Many are called, but few are chosen. But the way you know is you know. The way you don't know is, frankly, you don't know. You have not because you ask not. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be.